Welcome everybody. Thank you so very much for joining us tonight. I'm Andrea Miller, and this is our Accelerating Justice presentation this Thursday night. We have two very, very special guests, Camilla Chavez and Jasmine McGee, and they will be speaking to you later on tonight about a very, very critical topic that we all want to work toward. It's not just enough to fight for voting rights, but we also have to look at what is fair, what is just. And we're going to be exploring the concept of fairness and what is just tonight. And there will also be opportunities. We're hoping it will spur you to think about what you could do in your own community, because we will be looking at what North Carolina, a Southern state is doing in terms of achieving racial justice in the criminal justice system. So again, the notion of justice is something that is very, very possible. But in order to achieve justice, we need a plan and we must be very, very intentional. With that, I am going to introduce my very good friend from North Carolina, Evelyn Maben Hall of AMP America. And they are our partners in the Accelerating Justice series. So Evelyn, please introduce yourself, your group and say hello. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to our second series on Accelerating Justice. As Andrea said, my name is Evelyn Maven Hall. I'm a member of AmpAmerica.org Alliance of More Progressives. And AMP America, just a little bit about AMP America, it's an organization dedicated to educating Americans regarding existing and proposed governmental policies and legislation. And we do this to encourage civic engagement. Um, our members agree with Center of Common Ground that racial inequities destroy the fabric of our communities. Racial inequities in the criminal justice system appear to be the norm and have gone on far too long. The Commission Analysis Demographic Prison data from 2012 to 2016 found that Black men served sentences that are on the average 19% longer than those of white men for similar crimes. Longer sentences also apply to other people of color. Many of you have heard or read about the riot several days ago on Saturday, as a matter of fact, near the University of Boulder, Colorado. Approximately 800 students who were described as maskless, drunk, and sober marauders took to the streets entering three police officers and damaging property and vehicles. The news media did not mention any arrests at that time, but described the riot as a response to pandemic fatigue and pent up emotion. My first thought upon seeing this on CNN news was how many of the students would be dead or in jail had this occurred near a majority non-white college or in a neighborhood where mainly people of color reside. As history has proven, it is up to us to pick up the mantle and work toward and demand change. Our lives are far from perfect, but many things changed as a result of leaders and organizations who decided enough was enough and became activists to help change our world for the better. Because of them, many of us have opportunities some of our parents and ancestors would have never dreamed possible. We owe it to our generation and future generations to pick up the mantle and demand a fair and equitable justice system. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, and I quote, 300 years of humiliation, abuse and deprivation cannot be expected to find voice in a whisper. 
I can say without hesitation, Andrea Miller, Executive Director of Center for Common Ground, Reclaim Our Vote. Susan Hutter, Hutner, Center of Common Ground's North Carolina Community Organizer. And Nancy Goodben, uh, the volunteer organizer at their members and staff and partner organizations do not whisper when it comes to addressing human rights issues, not just in North Carolina, but in many other states. You can help us out by joining and supporting our efforts, ensuring the success of Governor Cooper's North Carolina Task Force of Racial Equity and Criminal Justice. Success in North Carolina, as I said, I think the, at the last meeting will likely result in a chain reaction, which hopefully will result in a fair and equitable justice system across the country. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Evelyn. Um, I'm going to take a moment to do a shout out to our board member, Dr. Gabriela Limos, who would normally be our moderator. Um, Gabby and her family um, have come down with COVID-19. That is why Gabby is not here. So, I will be your moderator tonight and I've got really huge shoes that I have to try to fill. So yes, want everybody to send love and healing to Dr. Lemus and her entire, entire family. All right, the business at hand, why are we here tonight? What are we working on doing? Tonight, we are going to be talking about the community imperative. The goal of the governor's task force is to center the justice system on making and keeping. We want to create and then we want to keep it going. Communities healthy and steadily reduce future problems by changing the focus of policing and wherever possible, diverting individuals to treatment and intervention services rather than criminal services such as law enforcement, arrest and incarceration. Policing as we know it is the gatekeeper of the criminal justice system. A single arrest, even if you aren't charged, can literally entangle you in a very costly justice battle. It can disrupt employment and literally change your life. People find themselves losing access to health, to their education and to economic mobility. Tonight, we've got two special guests, Special Deputy Attorney General and Director of the Public Protection Section, Jasmine McKee and Camila Chavez, co-founder and executive director of the Dolores Huerta Foundation, will talk about excellent local policy and bring focus to how we can begin to organize our communities to achieve racial justice. Our first speaker tonight is going to be Jasmine McGee. Jasmine McGee, as I already said, serves as Special Deputy Attorney General and Director of the Public Protection Section at the North Carolina Department of Justice. The Public Protection Section is the forward-facing unit of the North Carolina Attorney General's Office, and they handle public safety policy, outreach, related litigation, including gender-based violence, criminal justice reform, and consumer protection. So they've got a lot of work that they have to do. Ms. McGee is the lead counsel for the Governor's Task Force for Racial Equity and Criminal Justice. And in December last year, they published and they are working to implement 125 recommendations to improve racial equity in North Carolina's criminal justice system. 
This is one busy woman. She is also the Attorney General's representative on the North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission. She supervises the office's participation on the North Carolina Domestic Violence Commission, the Financial Literacy Council, and the Victims' Compensation Fund. Ms. McGee also serves as a member of the statewide Reentry Council Collaborative, including its steering committee. Enough of me talking about you, Jasmine. Jasmine, I want you to talk to us about what you're working on and any opportunities we have to be able to help. So Jasmine McGee, everyone. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. Every time I think that's a short bio, I'm like, I'm still listening. I need to shorten, make another, a short version of the short bio, but thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So I know that, um, that you all, or as a part of this series, even if you weren't here last time, have, have heard about our work in North Carolina for the Governor's Task Force for Racial Equity and Criminal Justice. Um, and, uh, and specifically from task force member, um, Senator Mushtaba Muhammad um, a few weeks ago. So I don't wanna to spend too much time on the background of the task force, um, but I do wanna spend a little bit of this opening time highlighting some of the recommendations um, um, and um, highlighting some of the sort of how we got to this point um, and, and pivot to where, um, where we're going now um, with a particular focus on um, the local work, um, because I understand that's how we want to organize tonight's conversation. So um, as you may recall, um, in June of 2020, um, um, Governor Cooper created the Task Force for Racial Equity and Criminal Justice in response to the voices of all North Carolinians who were asking for reforms um, and, and, um, and sort of our summer of reckoning. Um, and um, appointed my boss, Attorney General um, Josh Stein and um, Associate Justice Anita Earls of the North Carolina Supreme Court um, to co-chair it. Um, the, the executive order that created the task force did a number of other things, including um, creating a center at our State Bureau of Investigation um, for the Center um, Center for the Prevention of Law Enforcement Use of Deadly Force. Um, and so, so parallel work has been going on in other state entities as the task force um, has continued its work. Um, we issued our report in December of 2020. Um, as you heard earlier, there were 125 recommendations in, in the report. Um, and um, you can uh, find, the, find that. I'm going to put a, a slide up at the end um, on, with the website where you can find um, that report as well as an executive summary um, if, you, if you don't have the wherewithal for, for the, the full report. Um, and, and there's also a, a very handy chart. Um, so. Now, now what? Um, the executive order that created the task force um, created um, it through the end of 2022. And so um, we are still in existence and we're just getting started. Um, the governor and both co-chairs were very clear that they did not want this to be a um, uh, blue ribbon commission where the task force report just sat um, gathering dust. And so um, we have reorganized ourselves um, at our, during the first phase of our work, we were organized into working groups that were somewhat subject matter based. Um, we've now reorganized ourselves into implementation committees. Um, you see them here on your screen. Um, there is a, um, an executive branch implementation committee, a judicial branch uh, implementation committee, a legislative committee, uh, a local policy committee, communication and public education and data study and evaluations. Those last two are sort of overlapping committees um, that work on, on all kinds of issues. Um, I'm gonna spend the balance of my time talking about um, the local policy committee. And um, I, I wanna be clear that um, the, the, each, each one of these committees was um, assigned kind of primary responsibility for an area of recommendations. Um, but of course, these things, you know, can't always be put into, into clear boxes. And so, you know, different aspects of the task force will be working on different aspects of rec recommendations. But these are, are a few that we thought 
were, were particularly well um, placed to be worked on with local stakeholders. Um, and by local stakeholders, um, you're gonna see when I talk through this, I mean um, law enforcement, but I also mean local government. And I also mean community organizations and I also mean victim organizations. Um, and I mean grant makers. So, um, and, and perhaps there are other um, stakeholders that we've not yet thought of and would, would love to hear, hear from you if there are, there are groups that, that, um, that we should be thinking about in broad strokes that we, that we haven't yet. Um, and so um, that is sort of how I'm gonna organize um, what I'm going to talk about. And to that end, what the local um, stakeholder um, group decided, what the local um, policy group decided to do was to organize um, even further, <laughs> you, you all are organizers, you can appreciate this, um, to organize even further um, into somewhat stakeholder buckets. And this isn't to mean that these are the only stakeholders that are important in a particular recommendation. That's, it couldn't be further from the truth. There are many stakeholders that are important with particular recommendations, but there are stakeholders um, that have decision-making power when it comes to certain recommendations. And so we wanted to organize ourselves and think about that. Uh, and it may be a useful frame for you as you think about um, how on the local level, sort of outside of legislative strategy, statewide strategy, which of course we, we also have, and outside of the executive branch and going to cabinet agencies and using executive power, which we also have, um, how you can go to local stakeholders and local decision makers um, to try to achieve um, some of your um, racial equity goals. Um, so just this first one, I'm breaking the rule that I identified right away. Um, and that is um, that th th this, is, this is not a set of recommendations that is actually assigned to our local policy group, um, but because they, the use of force issues are so critical to what brought the task force into existence and what brought us all together, I felt that it was important to sort of highlight some of the recommendations um, that were very, um, um, sort of critical to the task force um, centering its work. And so um, the first recommendation is, um, uh, the, this set of recommendations is all about use of force and the revision of use of force standards. And um, we're hopeful that, that you know, there's a chance that some of this will be enacted at the statewide policy level um, in North Carolina. Um, but these are also things that law enforcement agencies can do starting today um, to, um, to improve um, their local policy and practice, um, including making policies prohibiting um, chokeholds um, and making policies um, regarding using the minimum amount of force necessary, uh, requiring officers to um, have first aid kits and to render aid, um, requiring a duty to intervene or report um, excessive use of force. Um, and of course, um, reporting, defining um, and, and reporting on their use of force because that is, that is something that we don't necessarily know as much as we need to know about. Um, so these are all things that I wanted to, to highlight as important um, for, for um, asking our law enforcement stakeholders to do. Um, and I think that there are things that are um, very achievable and um, that there should be a lot of consensus around. Also in this um, stakeholder bucket is a, a, a large number of recommendations for, regarding investigatory practices. Um, we heard a lot of um, information at the task force um, about um, the fact that at a, on a national level, nearly 40% of drug arrests were for possessing or selling 0.25 grams of drugs or less. And a, an additional 20% of arrests were for possession between 0.25 and one gram. Um, and when the task force heard that, it seemed very clear to us that um, our, what we thought was happening in our, in our prosecution and enforcement of drug laws um, is actually not what's happening. And so the task, task force was very comfortable with recommending that, that we should not be using our law enforcement resources on prosecuting drug crimes for such small amounts, for trace amounts of drugs. Um, the task force also, and I put this here as a sort of and marijuana possession, that was one of the things that comes as no surprise that got one of the, some of the most media attention, but the task force did recommend um, that uh, marijuana be immediately decriminalized and that we study a legalization um, model for North Carolina. Um, and so, but the point there for law enforcement is that law enforcement can de-emphasize and make, but they can't make it legal, right? But they can make it the lowest law enforcement priority as can prosecutors. So your local prosecutor, your local, local um, law enforcement 
can stop, can essentially decriminalize marijuana in your local jurisdiction. Um, there are also recommendations related to consent searches, uh, requiring them to be um, based on written informed consent, uh, prioritizing traffic stops and, um, and issuing citations and summons uh, to avoid people um, unnecessarily going into the jail. Um, uh, one more slide on the law enforcement stakeholder bucket. There were a number of recommendations related to community policing as you see here. I wanna highlight this idea, this concept of public acknowledgement um, of mistakes by law enforcement in order to build community trust. Um, we've already started thinking about how you implement that. And we know that one of the barriers is frankly, sorry to say, lawyers, um, you know, um, I know them, I am one. Um, and, um, you know, I think people are, are, are concerned about questions of liability, but are not thinking about what healing um, can be promoted um, by acknowledgement of, of, of mistakes, of, of, of mistrust, of, of community pain. Um, and so we're excited about the possibilities of having that conversation with local jurisdictions in North Carolina, local law enforcement agencies in North Carolina. Um, that's along the same lines of trying to, trying to figure out what does it mean to have community policing? I mean, it's a term that people love to throw around, but we're trying to figure out what can we do to actually bring some meaning um, to that term. Um, and then you see here um, um, a recommendation that um, really is aimed at looking at over-policing and police presence in neighborhoods. And we struggle with this one. We're still trying to figure out, we were working with our data team to figure out what this means because we don't want to um, sort of create um, new problems by saying, well, the data said this is where we should be, so let's just stay here. Um, but at the same time, we want to be able to figure out, well, what is the right way to um, have a law enforcement presence in a community if you're going to have it, which is obviously a conversation that's happening as well, simultaneous to all of these conversations. In most communities in North Carolina, if not all, we're going to have law enforcement. So then the question is, you know, what is the appropriate way to, to, um, to uh, for those law enforcement agencies um, to um, deploy their resources and how do you make sure that um, black and brown people are not disproportionately impacted by law enforcement presence negatively. Um, and then I have here um, a very, very small piece of our conversation and recommendations regarding school resource officers. And I'm excited to hear that, that um, Ms. Chavez is going to talk so much about education equity um, and, um, and school to prison pipeline issues. Um, one of the recommendations that we're gonna be working on is how can we get community more involved in what's happening with SROs? This was an area where, again, there was not, there was a lot of um, heated debate around the role of SROs in school and the task force did not get to consensus around that question, just like many communities have not been able to get to consensus around that question. But we did get to consensus around the fact that there are some changes that need to happen, um, not only in how SROs are, are selected, but how they're trained and how local schools are trained about what the proper use of an SRO is. Namely, they should not be used to handle disciplinary matters. Um, that's not their purpose and role. So now, um, after uh, I'm going to move to um, our local government um, stakeholder bucket. And you know, this, this next recommendation is really the crux of where we started after use of force. Um, this idea of reimagining public safety, and it means a lot of different things. And you'll see a theme here with the, through the rest of my slides that you know, one of the things the task force is really focused on is you know, what we need to not just think about tinkering around the edges. How can we be creative and thinking about what um, our community should look like? And specifically on this one, um, it's about adopting strategies to re respond to crisis that don't assume that law enforcement is the appropriate way to do that. So whether that be the co-responder model or our CAHOOTS type program that doesn't involve law enforcement at all, or at the very least, a specially trained crisis intervention unit. Um, and the reason that this recommendation is here with local government stakeholders is because, again, it's important not to put that at the foot of law enforcement to figure out, but local communities need to figure out what do we want to do and what do we want to fund in order to have appropriate response to people and make sure that there aren't bad outcomes for people that um, really um, should not be involved in, in, um, in law enforcement. 
Um, a few other things here that we wanna be working on with local government stakeholders, including the formation of um, local community safety and wellness task forces. This is modeled after something that's happening in my, in my hometown, Durham, North Carolina. Um, it's specifically focused to think about non-law enforcement strategies for promoting community wellness and safety. Um, there are bylaws um, that local communities can use if they're interested in thinking about something like this in their community. Of course, diversion programs, which we all know work are so important at every stage of the system, but in, in particular at those early stages before people get engaged in the criminal justice system in the first place. Um, funding more behavioral health um, professionals in schools, that training I was talking about um, before for school personnel. Um, and again, this is, a, this is a small piece of our overall bail recommendations, but at the local level, local communities can fund pretrial services that will provide people with, to help people meet their needs so that they can be successful in the pretrial process and really de-emphasize financial conditions of release, which we know can be um, so damaging to people and are applied um, with, um, with racial inequity. Um, and then finally, um, well, almost finally, um, I've got two more slides. Um, there is uh, a victim and community um, stakeholder bucket. Um, and I, this is where our restorative justice uh, recommendations live. It's where um, we decide we are planning to form a victim advisory group to help advise us on the best way to try to go forward and reimagining what our justice system responses could be so that they actually um, look to restore the harm that is done um, by crime. And I'm going to move a little bit quickly through these last couple of slides. Um, and then we also, we did a bucket that was focused um, on grant makers. And there, these, these recommendations live elsewhere as well, but, but it seemed to us that for some recommendations, there's already consensus that these are things that should happen, but there's not money to make those things happen. And so by thinking about what recommendations sit in that space, um, we thought it would be easier to help try and, and identify opportunities for funding for local communities. Um, and so some of the things that we um, wanted to do there are related to funding grassroots organizations, um, funding violence prevention programs, um, funding, um, you know, those, those alternative responses when people call 911 and those restorative justice programs. So that was a run through very quickly. Um, as I said, we are now in our implementation phase working uh, on a quarterly um, meeting basis for the full task force, monthly, sometimes more often with our community, local community uh, and local committees. And you can keep up with the task force um, at ncdoj.gov slash track. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jasmine. Great presentation. And I love hearing about what is going on in North Carolina. There's a lot of work to do. And I got a lot of ideas that we might want to try to recommend in Virginia. Um, in our current legislative session, we basically have legalized recreational marijuana. So we are completely trying to remove it from one of the problem areas. And then we're also looking at using the tax money to reinvest in communities that have historically been harmed by the war on drugs. We, we are watching our neighbors to the North very carefully and, and we're very interested in that model. Um, and, and we're hopeful. Of course, that's something that has to happen at the legislature. Um, but in the meantime, right, that's the message. In the meantime, while you're working to get there, there are things you can be doing in your local communities. So yes, if Virginia gives us, gives us all hope. Who would have thought? I'm a little embarrassed that Virginia- I know, in drugs. 2015, <laughs> looking at Virginia, everybody would have just written us off and look at us now. Never give up. Never give up. That's right. That's right. Now, for our next speaker, Camila Chavez. She is the co founder and executive director of the Dolores Wert Foundation, and that is in Bakersfield, California. She oversees training for low income community members in the area of leadership and organizing skills specific to 
and this is what we do, this is where we live, civic and electoral participation. So I love this. So they can become catalysts for change in their own communities. The ideals of nonviolence, selfless motivation, and personal responsibility were instilled in Camilla by her parents, Richard Chavez and Delores Suerta. Camilla grew up at the United Farm Workers headquarters of La Paz, where those same ideals were reinforced through the actions of people like her uncle, Cesar Chavez. Now, I'm going to have to say that when I was 12 years old, I had the incredible privilege of attending organizing training sponsored by my very radical Catholic church that was led by Cesar Chavez. It was an experience that I have remembered all my life. So Camilla, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Awesome, thank you. So glad to be here. Um, I wanted to, um, you know, begin just um, for those that don't know Dolores Arthur, right? She co-founded the Farm Workers Union with Cesar Chavez at 90 years old, is a full-time volunteer with our organization, uh, training uh, organizers, and uh, just, you know, um, it's as strong as ever. So um, wanted to paint the picture of Kern County uh, where we are based, not only is it the birthplace of the United Farm Workers Union, but also, um, and now I'm losing track of time, and I want to say maybe it was 2015 or 16 that The Guardian um, did, uh, you know, major research on all the um, deaths in the hands of law enforcement, and Kern County was actually number one in the entire country for deaths in the hands of law enforcement, not only by the sheriffs, the Kern County Sheriff's Department, but also by Bakersfield Police Department combined. Um, the Department, California Department of Justice um, recently uh, concluded a two to three year investigation, which resulted in a settlement. And, um, you know, we have just begun that process of um, trying to get, you know, um, community engagement and input on how the sheriff's department specifically will uh, reform many of their um, bad habits. So um, it was so great to hear um, the work um, from Ms. McGee and hope to learn more and uh, in connect about that. Um, the com what I will focus on um, today is our work that's more on the, the grassroots uh, level. And I'm going to share a presentation with our uh, education equity work we have uh, the story I'm going to tell specifically on Kern High School District, which is the largest high school district in California. Um, and to paint the picture, um, you should know that up until 2009, one of the schools had a rebel mascot, a Confederate image in a high school that's majority Black and Latinx. Um, there are street names after Confederate fig figures across the school site. And... Um, there's also to this day a school named Plantation Elementary. <laughs> so um, even though we are in progressive California, Kern County feels more like um, a different state entirely. Um, that our journey into the education justice organizing um, began in um, 2011. What happened is that here at Kern High School District, we have 40,000 students but the demographics of teachers are not reflected in the student population. 65% are black and brown students compared to 60% of the teachers uh, who are white and the percentage is even higher for administrators in the district. So in 2009 to 2010, the Federal Department of Education uh, published a report showing the discriminatory practices of the district showing huge disparities for black and brown students compared to their white peers. In that same year, 2009 to 2010, over 2,500 students were expelled from this one school district. 90% were um, expelled for non-mandatory offenses, meaning um, it wasn't related to you know, drugs or assault, um, which you know, fall under the zero tolerance. Um, and big surprise, right, the majority of these students were um, Black and Latinx. 
Uh, so at this time, parents were reaching out to the Dolores Huerta Foundation. They were seeking out legal advice, and now we had data to validate their lived experiences. So um, DHF led the creation of the Current Education Justice Collaborative. We are a network of community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, legal entities, and uh, parents, students, and educators. So our strategies include community outreach and education. We um, teach, you know, know your rights and um, learning about school board governance. We have a communication strategy, raising awareness about the issue with um, about issues, and we purchase billboards. We do op eds, uh, share the stories of lived experiences by those who are most impacted. We do budget advocacy. Luckily, at this uh, time, uh, Governor Brown enacted what is called the local control funding formula, which became law, giving the community the opportunity to have voice in how the district allocates funding for high need students. Specifically, we're talking about English language learners, foster youth, and low income students. So in 2013, uh, the Current Education Justice Collaborative worked to divert funding from police and schools into programs to improve school climate and increase parent engagement. And then the final strategy is a policy and litigation. In 2014, the legal agencies filed a lawsuit on behalf of Dolores Huerta Foundation and other organizations and 14 families who experienced this push out. Um, after three years, we reached a historic settlement. It was the first of its kind, which created a system of accountability that required the district to provide disaggregated data and progress reports to the community via community forums. Kern High School District was forced to do an overhaul on their disciplinary practices at the district and was also required to provide data and progress reports, like I've said. Um, they also um, had to implement PBIS in schools, that's positive behavioral intervention supports, uh, mandated to hire Black and Latinx educators. KEJC was also successful in diverting $4 million from police and schools to restorative justice and improving school climate. The district also created 11 parent centers based on our um, advocacy and biggest news is that there's been a significant decrease in the number of expulsions. So if you remember, it was 2,500. Well, in um, 2019, 10 years later, the number of expulsions went down to 20 students. So here, um, our timeline is very important because it shows the trajectory of the intentional organizing and strategizing, recognizing that all this although this lawsuit is historic, and the first of its kind, it was not going to change everything in the district. We've experienced many challenges and the district tried to keep our parents from voicing their concerns at community forums. Uh, the community has had to continuously pressure the district to follow through on the agreement. Um, for example, in this settlement agreement, we it just sunsetted and the district did not make progress on hiring diverse staff. So that's an issue that we're still um, contending with. Uh, so now we're working to develop um, the community's consciousness around movement building that regardless of policy, we cannot get rid of the harms of the educational system until we address the root cause, right? So we know that systemic racism that exists in our schools to oppress black and brown people. Our next steps are to defund the current high school district police. Uh, we are working on black and brown solidarity. We are a segregated community. Um, and the school district um, also has six nurses for 40,000 students, but funds an entire police department for $4 million a year for one high school district. Vecinos Unidos and the Dolores Huerta uh, Foundation Youth are active in 17 school districts. We uh, work in four counties, that's Kern, Tulare, Fresno, and Los Angeles County in the Antelope Valley area. Uh, Dolores Huerta Foundation provides support to each education committee through the strategies of organizing, advocacy, and coalition building. 
parent and youth education empowerment and leadership development. And I'll also say that many of the um, parents in our own committee have since won, uh, uh, ran and won school board positions. So through this advocacy, they you know, realize, hey, I could be the one up there making this decision. That's my neighbor, right? And so um, we are um, so thankful for that. Okay, so um, for our budget advocacy, Vecinos and Youth participated in a series of trainings on the local control accountability plan that's related to the local control funding formula that I mentioned earlier. So what we do is we actually print out these budgets that are hundreds of pages long. We also mandate that they be um, uh, translated and printed in Spanish as well for Spanish speaking parents and youth. And we go through and we analyze these budgets page by page, millions and millions of dollars right on the line. And through this process, vecinos and youth create budget recommendations and messaging. So in 2019, we um, treated it as a campaign, um, you know, um, throughout all of these districts where we work. And uh, vecinos and youth, um, they uh, hosted town halls to inform their communities about the LCAP process. We invited school district board administrators and staff to hear their recommendations. And then we also created this messaging, right, where you can see um, these um, lawn signs that were created asking for counselors and nurses in our schools now. And so as you <laughs> drove through the towns, you would see these lawn signs um, on fences and uh, throughout the community. Uh, the vecinos and youth gathered 1,200 signatures, <clears throat> excuse me, to garner support for their LCAP recommendations. And as a result, 42 recommendations were adopted. So a total of 805 vecinos, those uh, vecinos unidos are our members and that means uh, neighbors united. Um, so the vecinos and the youth, um, there were eight, over 800 that participated in this um, campaign across the 17 school districts and the results um, and the adoptions, right? The recommendations that were adopted included parent coordinators cultural performance arts, removing funding for police and schools, providing additional psychologists, counselors, social workers, nurses, having culturally sensitive libraries, parent education classes, and more. So this is um, you know, really uh, what, what we've been doing on the local level. DHF is a part of several regional and statewide coalitions as well. We are co-sponsoring Assembly Bill 610 uh, which encourages schools to adopt non-punitive, supportive, trauma-informed, and health-based approaches to school-related behaviors, uh, increasing educator discretion in, in determining when to notify law enforcement about a student's school-related behaviors, um, eliminating prosecution of school staff who fail to report incidents of alleged assaults or physical threats against school employees, and eliminating the criminal penalty for willful disturbance of public schools. That has been our catch all here in California and I'm sure in other places. Um, so eliminating the willful disturbance of public schools and public school meetings. Our other legislative work um, includes the promotion of um, or advocating for ethnic studies throughout the state. Um, as well as right now, um, our committees are um, going to their school districts to promote Dolores Huerta Day. So here in the state of California, April 10th is not an official holiday, but it's recognized as Dolores Huerta Day. Um, and we are also very engaged in redistricting. So um, this is a continuation of our work on the 2020 census, uh, where we reached 84,000 individuals directly to educate them about the importance of the census. And uh, now we are going back and um, engaging uh, community members, um, educating on them on the process of redistricting and why it's important. You know, it happens every 10 years. So folks forget or, you know, maybe they're new to this country and then, you know, don't really understand what this means. And then we're also engaging community residents to help draw and advocate for fair maps. And so we invite you to join our network. Um, we do have um, 
you could also go to joindhf.org and uh, give us uh, your um, information and uh, keep you connected. We don't send a whole lot of emails, I promise. Um, so um, that uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much for that presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, one of the things that I want to do is tie these two presentations together because what Jasmine was speaking about is when we are looking at adults and we are determining what is the most humane way to treat people and achieve community, protecting health and safety. And when we look at Camilla's presentation, it exposes what we often call the school to prison pipeline, where young people, and I've heard people say as early as four or five, almost pre kindergarten, childish behavior literally is criminalized. And once you enter the system, it is almost impossible to get out. So thank you so very much for all of your work. And I tell you, Camilla, I will be contacting you because some very, very, very exciting things that you've done. I'm going, I wanna make sure that I've got everything organized to present and build things like that into our democracy centers, which are in community of color areas in mostly Southern and some Western states. All right, since our speakers were beyond fabulous in terms of managing time. I am going to go off camera and I am going to put them on gallery view and we're going to have some Q&A. I've got a question that I want to ask each of my panelists. What do you see as the biggest barrier to progress on bias-free decision-making and community well-being centered outcomes. So Jasmine, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think whether I have the same answer to both of those things. I'll take the latter because it's a little bit, it comes to mind more, more quickly. Um, I mean, I think we we fundamentally um, need a paradigm shift um, in thinking about um, what it means to be safe and what works to promote safety. Um, and we have um, for a long time just promoted um, more arrest, more incarceration, uh, more puni punitive response at every level from childhood through adulthood, as you said, um, and um, until we start to reimagine what that can look like, until we start to think about, um, you know, sort of how we can address our, our community challenges um, in a better way, you know, th that's a pretty big barrier to, to anything, to any work. Um, I mean, bias free, I'm not sure you can get to bias free, but you can certainly um, identify bias, you can call it, you can name it, you can train about it, certainly. Um, and you certainly can't be colorblind, right? You need to be color conscious and you need to understand the ways in which bias and um, sort of inequity permeate every part of society. And I think that's a starting point for folks. It's not the end, but it's, you do have to get there. And I think for some people they're not there yet. So I think that's a barrier. Um, I think I hit both parts of the question. Um, yes. yes, you did. Okay. Yes, you did. Excellent. Camilla, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with everything um, that Jasmine said. And I would just add that I believe that it's the lack of civic engagement and democratic participation 
uh, because we know that and when we um, go into a community and begin to organize and uh, listen to individuals and figure out what's going on in their community and teach them that they have to be responsible, you know, working with their neighbors to um, be the change that they want to see, uh, you know, this um, empowerment, the leadership development, I feel that um, without that, right, you have these barriers and so, um, and challenges. And I think that, um, you know, apathy um, is, is, is really big and detri detrimental to our communities, um, but it's teaching people. And then when they um, experience these initial wins and victories, then they're hooked and uh, they keep wanting to do more, right? And so um, we really have to invest that time and energy into um, grassroots organizing um, so that we can have, um, you know, this kind of grassroots level of advocacy and then, you know, the working with the policymakers at the top and, um, and all listening to each other and working in coalition. I, I love that. And I know every one of our volunteers probably went, yay, grassroots advocacy. Yes, grassroots activism. We love that because we very much are a grassroots organization. Uh, my next question, and then I'm going to open it up to our folks that are in the room, is when the people that are elected are obviously the wrong people or they're using all the wrong behaviors. Who do we need to bring from the community to begin that influence so that we can achieve the change we want? In Virginia, a lot of times we go and get local pastors. Um, Jasmine? Um, yes, I mean, everybody, <laughs> um, yes, absolutely local pastors. Um, I think, um, you know, you know, we're talking about grassroots. And so I think it's important to understand that that organizing doesn't look the same way it looked, you know, 20, 30 years ago, um, particularly in black and brown communities. Um, there are, um, you know, I, I think our communities are on the whole not as religious as they once were. Um, and so we need to not sort of put all our eggs in that in that basket. Um, you know, um, there are lots of um, sort of intersectional groups, right? People are understanding this, this concept of inter intersectionality. There is a lot of LGBT um, organiza organizing groups that are recognized that their organization, their organizing needs to include racial equity. Um, you know, um, figuring out the um, professional stakeholders. I mean, I think it's very obvious that like law enforcement or mayors or city councils, those are obvious, but thinking about things like social workers, you know, social worker stakeholder organizations or um, teachers or, you know, all, all the people that see this stuff up front and, and organizing them to sort of be a part of the solution. Um, I think is really important. So I really, I, I, I say that, you know, jokingly, but I really do mean everybody because um, it infects everybody. And it's really sort of how can you hook that person into the, into the conversation? How can you use their sphere of influence? Camilla. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, you know, my first response was the community members, you know, showing up to those meetings. Um, now we have the challenge, right? We're in the pandemic. Um, not sure how much longer we're going to be in um, this virtual situation, um, but it has been more challenging actually um, to have, um, you know, young people and their and parents and community members at large um, engage in these virtual city council meetings, school board meetings. Um, but, uh, so, you know, that, that's one challenge. Um, and, and then I would just suggest centering the voices of those who are most impacted, right? So, um, you know, encouraging them to do, you know, op-ed letters, you know, earned media, um, you know, getting them in front of a camera. And then we just have to continue the, um, the um, narrative mm -hmm. development, right? Because when we first started, it was current high. Um, you know, mm -hmm. folks didn't understand that there was a crisis uh, in our local education system. And now we understand that it's statewide and national. 
right? And so we always have to continue doing that work. And, and I'm also thinking people might not have understood the power that they had to change things. Sometimes people go, well, it's always been like that and I don't really see how I'm going to be able to change it. Well, I'm gonna start with you because you mentioned it, federal policy. Are there any federal policies that we need? Um, I spent a good deal of my recent past history, I sort of reinvent myself every five years. Um, working on Capitol Hill, working on federal policies. One of the policies that I always fought very, very hard against was the whole militarization of the police. What else do we need to address from a federal perspective? The list is long. That's a long way. <laughs> well, all right, give me your top three. Okay, the top three I just wrote down as you uh, started that uh, question was uh, HR1 uh, for uh, voting reforms, uh, yep. immigration reform, as we know, and increased minimum wage, increased federal uh, minimum wage. I love that. Yes. Yeah, so um, right now, if we did it now, $15 an hour would work in some places. $15 an hour isn't getting you anywhere in New York or San Francisco. So again, the minimum wage, we really need that living wage. Um, Jasmine, federal policy, what do we need? Sure. Um, I, I actually immediately went to, to um, the, um, the, mili the, the US DOJ um, military funding of local um, law enforcement. Um, I think there needs to um, you know, be, be a, ser a serious look at that, a serious look at federal asset forfeiture um, programs. Um, I'm going to sort of stay n narrow into the criminal justice context because, as, as we said, so many things. Um, I think, you know, the um, questions around qualified immunity, um, you know, really need to have an, an honest conversation. Um, I think um, it, that it, it's, it's very much fallen into a sort of elimination of qualified immunity or like the thing we have now, which is ridiculous. It makes it completely impossible to ever get past it. Um, and, and we're in a posture, as we all know, of um, lack of compromise and discussion. And so um, that, that's unfortunate because I think that's a conversation we ought to be able to have. Um, at the same time, I, I often say, I think this is the same as, you know, with regard to officer-involved shootings. Of course, we want to make sure that law enforcement who have unlawfully killed people are held responsible and that, you know, strange things don't happen with grand juries and victims aren't put on trial. But, you know, what we want even more. We want people to not be killed by law enforcement, right? <laughs> like, that is more important. Um, and we can do more, we can do hard things. We can do more than one thing at a time. But I just want us to keep centered on the fact that we want to have early, earlier strain interventions. We want prevention. Um, and we want to we want a system in which this doesn't happen. Thank you both very very much. Um, I may have time for one more question from the audience. I know I said I wasn't going to ask more questions, but then I kept getting sort of all excited, going, "Oh, I've got one more question." So, uh, Keen, is there anything that you've seen in the chat? Um, I. I see one um, and it's in the chat and it's about North Carolina. Um, are the needs of the African-American transsexual community being addressed by the North Carolina Department of Justice, especially around the area of incarceration? So um, I, I'm not sure what if there's a specific thing that you're asking about, um, you if, if you're from North Carolina, you may know that our office wears a number of different hats, which sometimes makes my work really interesting. Um, one of the hats that we wear, in addition to sort of working on public safety policy for, for the people of, of North Carolina, is that we also represent state agencies, um, and that includes um, the North Carolina Department of Public Safety. So um, if this is related to 
to some state litigation. Um, that's not something I can really comment on, but I can certainly tell you that consistent with all of our other work, we, um, you know, the Attorney General believes in the, the humanity of all people um, and is working to protect all people in every way that, that he possibly can. And I, um, as I said at the beginning, or maybe I said this off before we got started, um, protecting the public is kind of in the name of the job. Um, and so um, I, can, I can tell you that. And if, if there are some, is a more specific question, happy to, to follow up offline. Jasmine, Camilla, it has been a wonderful, wonderful evening. I am so thrilled that I got the opportunity to moderate this panel because normally that doesn't fall to me. That goes to my board member who immediately grabbed it and said, oh, I want to be moderator. And we were like, okay. So thank you, Jasmine McGee, North Carolina. All right, I want to get your title right. Special Deputy Attorney General and Director of the Public Protection Section, and Camilla Chavez, Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Dolores Huerta Foundation. And your mom is who I want to be when I grow up. She was our, one of our, she was our first guest when we were doing our very first series on voting in troubled times last year. So Jasmine, Camilla, thank you both so you. very, very much. And unfortunately, because I got to moderate, I'm probably now going to be bothering you about stuff. I've got all these ideas in my mind. So good night. It was marvelous and inspirational. And I want to thank all of my guests. Now, oh, I always have to give them things to do. Please visit our website. We are going to, we have new phone banks that we are bringing up every day. Please go visit centerforcommonground.org. We will very shortly begin phone banking into Virginia because Virginia is having our statewide elections in 2021. We're one of those states where we love elections so much. We have them every single year. So early voting in Virginia starts right around April 10th. So our phone banks are going to be up right around the end of March. We have already begun postcarding the deregistered voters. We will then turn and pivot and begin postcarding all the registered voters because Virginia has early voting. We didn't have, or the first time we had early voting was last year. And so we are still very, very concerned that people may not really realize and understand they are not limited to voting on June 8th in the Virginia primary. And then one last plug for Virginia. 2021 will be an historic year in Virginia for the community of color candidates that have graced the top of our ticket. In 2021, we have three African-American women running for governor of the Commonwealth. We have one African-American man for lieutenant governor. We have one Muslim man, two Latinx women, and a black man running for lieutenant governor. And for attorney general, we have an African-American man running for attorney general. Periodically, I have to pinch myself and remind myself that this is Virginia, former capital, emphasis on the word former capital of the Confederacy.
So be prepared to work with us. We love working with you. We are going to be working with our brothers and sisters in North Carolina as you introduce your legislation to achieve racial justice in the criminal justice system. And I will be looking very hard at AB 610. It looks like a wonderful bill. And there may be people who would like to do a little work around California legislation. Let's take a look. So good night, everyone. Thank you very much. We do change the world every day with the work that we do. So thank you all very much.